That, that's me, your lighthearted host and expressionist. And this, this is my podcast, Love and Lies. We're going to call you Shay today. When I originally met you, uh, we had a good hour with each other before we actually discovered or didn't discover, but kind of walked into this conversation about right. bulimia and anorexia and, and you being a ballerina. Mm-hmm. And so it kind of took me off guard because I never really thought about how intense or that being something that's pretty prominent in the ballerina industry. So right. tell me about that. Tell me how long you've been dancing. Tell me when this started for you, what, what you started experiencing. Right. So I've been dancing for 11 years at this point, and I've always taken it very seriously. So I've always been on the pre-professional route. And um, my eating disorder really began at around 16 and continued on for two years. And it's something I really still struggle with till this day. I read something that said that around the age of six is when young girls start sizing themselves up in the dance world, in the ballerina world. Is that pretty accurate? Is that something that you experienced at that age? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're surrounded by mirrors constantly, and all they tell you to do is check yourself in the mirror, make sure that everything looks correct that you look like everyone else so it's always been something that you're just always looking at yourself in the mirror making sure that everything looks exactly right and and it also mentioned that young ballerinas look up to older dancers yeah and you see that they are very thin and they've got this physique and their abilities and and is that obviously a result of bulimia and anorexia Truly it is. I mean, when you're younger and you're looking at who gets the soloist part and who's the sugar plum fairy and the nutcracker and all of these things, I mean, ballet has a very special and certain aesthetic and those ballerinas that usually do look like that, it's not necessarily always the healthiest way. And you can definitely tell, probably not at that young of an age, the difference between someone who's healthy and just naturally thin and really working out and watching the weight and someone who's not doing it in the healthiest of ways, but distinguish that when you're young. When I think of a ballerina, I think of grace. I think of beauty, sophistication, uh, very elegant. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole other side to this. Very competitive. Oh, yes. Talk to me about that and, and where other ballerinas size themselves up against each other in a room where everybody's competing. Yeah. I mean, I've been to so many different auditions and as soon as you walk in to the audition, you're wearing your warm up. No one can even really necessarily even see your body. And you're just looking at what brands are wearing. If they have a jacket on that says a certain dance studio, a certain ballet company or anything like that. And you just sit there and everyone's looking around, watching each other stretch, watching each other warm up, seeing who's the most flexible is seeing who can do the best stretches and different things like that. So it really even starts before a teacher even walks in. And then once a teacher walks in, it gets even more intense and you're watching different groups. And then you have to go and you say, oh, that girl did so much better in this way. I have to be better than that. And looks are definitely a part of that for sure. Well, I think what I'm learning is that in this industry, appearance is everything. Oh, yeah. It's one of the first things that they base you off when you walk in an audition. Everyone always says the audition starts as soon as you walk in the building. And then you see everyone's body and what leotards they're wearing and what tights they're wearing and how it makes them look a certain way, who's hiking up their leotards and different things. And they really, they make you stand in a line at the end and they just walk by you and look at you up and down. There's a lot of emphasis on appearance and you are being torn apart from head to toe. Yeah, really scrutinized, honestly. So does a does a parent know this when they are signing little Jenny up for ballet class when she's three and she's got the tutu no. and her little 
you know, a little bun in her hair and a ballet suit. <laughs> right, because you started off like that, right? I mean, right. Yeah, no, not at all. I mean, you obviously know that it requires a certain type of discipline, and that's usually why parents want to get their kids into it. They want them to be disciplined and have a place to exert their energy and learn how to be maybe graceful, less clumsy, things like that. But there's no way that you could know down the line that how intense it can possibly get, honestly. What? If you've been in the business. Right. What age did you really start thinking, okay, I've got to figure out something here? Did you choose bulimia over anorexia? I mean, is where, why did you choose one over the other? Did you practice both of them? Yeah. Tell me about that moment where you were like, I got to figure something out or I got to make a decision or you're already convinced this is no other choice. Right. So I was around, I want to say 15, 16, and we started really getting intense with it. And I was going to really competitive ballet intensives. And I just saw that I was going through puberty and I have a pretty big bust for being a ballerina and I have hips. So it wasn't always the easiest thing. So I really didn't know. And I wasn't, I was eating healthy. I was exercising, obviously, like I was dancing 25 hours a week. I was doing as much as I possibly could. And I just said, I'm not getting the results. I don't look like everyone else. I'd go to these competitive ballet intensives over the summer and I would see how tiny these girls were. And I was, I knew something had to change. And I knew about obviously these eating disorders just from the media and honestly other girls at these summer intensives and things like that. So I honestly used a combination of anorexia and bulimia because I tried to do the not eating as much, but then at times I would have to eat to cover it up or I would be so hungry and then I'd feel so guilty as soon as I ate one thing so I would go purge and try to make myself throw it up because I felt so terrible and I was like oh my gosh I'm going to gain all of this hard work that I've done which with the not eating and things like that and it was just terrible. So you start noticing that your body is changing. Yeah. Now it sounds like you start comparing yourself. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you yeah. see and hear other girls comparing themselves to the others. Yeah. Now you're realizing that other girls aren't eating what you're eating. Correct. And tell me about the first time. Do you remember the first time that you made yourself throw up? Do you, and explain the difference, actually, for the listeners, the difference between bulimia and anorexia. So anorexia is when you restrain yourself from eating so you're really just not having any income of food any nutrients or anything like that and then while bulimia is more of you'll eat and then you'll immediately before it hits your digestive tract go to the bathroom and make yourself throw up which can really do a lot of damage to like your teeth and different things like that so I tried to and like obviously sometimes it would cut my throat with my like fingernails and things like that so I really tried to stay away from that but if I felt so guilty after eating, I would do that. And I remember the first time was actually at my high school because everyone was starting to weren't eating lunch. And I was like, oh, I just forgot it. And then I forgot it for about a week. And people were like, oh, my gosh, I'll buy you food. Like, stop. And I was like, no, please don't. Like, I'm fine. I just forgot it again. And someone finally bought me food. And I didn't want to be rude. So I was like, thank you so much. And I, it was a bag of chips. And I ate this little bag of chips. And then I said I had to go to the bathroom. and I. No one was in the bathroom at the time because it was lunchtime and I made myself throw up. When you were saying to them, really, honestly, I, I just left my lunch again. Was there any cry for help in that tone? Were you, were you like, I'm, is anybody noticing? Is there any, was there anything or was it really not, straight up? You were just really, I just left my lunch and let's drop it. Not at that, not at that point because I really wanted to do it because I, even after just a week, you see a little bit of results. You see how easy it is and how fast the results are. Like your stomach just is less bloated after a few days and then just different things. And so I was really excited, honestly. So I didn't want anything different to happen. So I didn't want anyone noticing. I would try to bring like just my water bottle and drink like a water bottle at lunch. So it looked like I was doing something. Like I tried to find all these little things to kind of have no one notice. So you would go from anorexia to forcing yourself to eat 
to forcing yourself to throw up. Right. Getting the results that you wanted. And I'm sure at this point you're being praised. Of course. For looking good. Right. Do they know what you're doing at this point? No. No one does. Mom doesn't. Coach no. doesn't. Mm-mm. You're just getting the positive re-encouragement that this is looking good. This is yeah. that this is looking good, and you're like, okay, this is where it's at. I can keep on doing this. Right. Um. How long did you practice? It was really on and off. Well, it was pretty steady for about a year, and then I tried. I was kind of I hit a wall where I was so exhausted all the time where I could barely go to dance. Like I would have all these crazy dance days and I would start crying at the end because I was so tired. I couldn't even get through some of the combinations in class. And I was so upset and it made me so sad through some parts of it with like out even realizing how sad I was. I was so sad and I tried to stop and then A week went by with me trying to eat a little bit more, and then I went back to it because I was so stressed out that I had been eating for that week. So practicing these two, the bulimia and anorexia, really is about the mental. It's it's a disorder in the way that you're acting this out, but now it's changed your mind. It's changed. Right. It's it's rewired you. Right. It's so hard to go back to being normal or back to being healthy. Tell me about how everything changed. Yeah, so when I was, I was applying to go to college and different programs, so I was auditioning, and that's when it got really bad again because I was so nervous about auditioning that I wanted to look my best, and I thought that's what my best was, so it got pretty severe and finally my friend my best friend realized that something was wrong she was older than me so she was already in college so she didn't see me all the time so she saw me change really rapidly because she'd see me every few months so she'd see like drastic changes while everyone else who saw me like day to day just thought oh she's losing weight slight like slowly but it was a lot more rapid for her and she ended up telling my mom that she thought that there was a problem and that's when I ended up getting help. So your mother comes to you and says, what's going on? And you admit? Yeah, at that point, I was really broken and upset. And I think at that point, I kind of was waiting for a cry for help because I didn't know what to do. I knew it was wrong and not right because I didn't feel right. But I wasn't sure how to go about it. And I didn't know if there was any way I could be look that good and dance that well any other way so at the same time I didn't want anyone to know but then when my mom came to me I was honestly so relieved were the other ballerinas I mean are I just want to ask like Mm -hmm. the bathroom and the gym where you guys practice I mean is the next stall over they're throwing up and you just um don't pay any attention to it do you talk about it is it is an open discussion is it something that nobody speaks about um people talk about it but I feel like it comes more from a malicious way honestly like people are never people are always talking behind your back kind of thing and like people will talk about you if you're getting, gaining weight people will talk about you if you're losing weight people always just talk about you no matter what so it's kind of like but no one will say it to your face of course because no one wants to like confront people but obviously, sometimes you have to, and those are good friends and good people, but sometimes it's hard for people to, they don't know what to say, they don't know how to deal with it. So I understand, kind of, but people always talk about it. The coaches, mm-hmm. uh, when you and I spoke last week, you had mentioned that they put the pressure on for this. Do they even suggest it? I mean, what, these are supposed to be big supporters and I would assume uh, would want their ballerinas to, you know, (laughs) you to be your health health. And this is not the case. Right. Um, I mean, so many teachers have told me, oh, you look great. Keep doing what you're doing. 
So I'm not really sure. They don't know, obviously, exactly what happens behind closed doors and what you're doing, but they'll encourage, like, keep doing what you're doing because they think, whatever, it's probably in the best way. And then, obviously, there's always downfalls to being on the opposite end of being a little bit heavier for a dancer um, in comparison to everyone else because you won't get a part. So, obviously, in that way, you're not getting positive feedback. And then, or even they can go and have a meeting with you and let you know, especially in three professional levels, they do want to prepare you. They are trying to help you and say, this will not make you as successful if you look this way. But at the same time, it's hard when you get like ultimatums or things like that, because obviously if you're trying to do things super fast, that's obviously the easiest way. So if something doesn't change, you're not going to get the part. Right. You're not going to get the role of. Correct. Or any role at all, right? So, 8 million women, 1 million men have Mm -hmm. eating disorders. It's a scary number. And they say 2 to 3 in 100 American women suffer with bulimia. Wow. And one of my awareness pieces was on bulimia or is on bulimia and anorexia and I posted something on Facebook Mm -hmm. because I had this concept for the art piece and I wanted to I simply asked give me some of the thoughts that one with bulimia who struggles with bulimia and anorexia has the direct messages, the text messages, the phone calls, Mm -hmm. the comments just started flooding in. Yeah. And I was getting stories and I was getting, I'm fat. I'm not good enough. This is the last time. Right. I'm not sick. I mean, just constantly. It was almost like each one of their stories were exactly like the other. Right. I was touched Hi everyone, this is MJ Mangus, your host. Are you looking for answers in your own life? Something from your past holding you back? A bad relationship? Or are you wanting to do something you've always wanted to do? Anything that you're wanting to change in your life will require you to step into your power. Over the past eight years, I've been guiding people into walking their own empowered path as their personal power coach. The impact that coaching can have on all areas of your life is priceless, and it works as soon as you are ready. The truth is, you hold all the power to unlock what you want to overcome or become. I'd like to offer you the opportunity to be your power coach so that together we can transform your life and bridge the gap between where you are now and where you want to be. Please email me at loveandliespodcast at gmail.com for more information. Sessions are 100% confidential and absolutely no judgment. Discover, unlock, and overcome what is holding you back from your fullest potential. I look forward to working with you. Now, let's get back to what brought us together this episode of Love and lies. I love that we're talking about this, especially mm-hmm. from a ballerina point of view, because there is some, you know, you do look at a ballerina, and like I mentioned, there's so right. much beauty, mm-hmm. and there's this other side. You also mentioned that you would go to the bathroom. I want to talk about the signs, a couple of signs for anybody out there that you were, uh, how old were you when this started? 16. 16. So at the ages of even as early as six years old yeah young girls are starting to size themselves up and and start seeing things and noticing things um I think pretty prevalent at the age of what like 10 this is obviously very this is going on exactly so signs for anybody out there that might have uh, a child in ballet or just even in high school junior high or just in life right skipping meals yeah, skipping meals, probably becoming all my, whenever my mom asked questions or anything about it, I was always very short with her. I would 
honestly just more angry and upset as a person. My mood changed a lot. Um, and sometimes it's hard to differentiate that between being a teenager and having mood swings. And I was just going to say that. Like that. Yeah. But bathroom, so hard. trip yep. to the bathroom after meals. Immediately after meals because takes only like 20 minutes to really start get into your stomach when you really can't do that anymore so it's like immediately after eating or just yeah being really short with people like receding from group things like when people when your friends maybe ask to go out and eat go to a movie or do anything like that I would honestly just try to avoid those things because I didn't want the questioning that I would always get and I hated it being the center of attention so I really stopped hanging out with my friends a lot. Um, we have overeating is all, is actually yes. another sign. Right. Yep. Overeating and then purging or them feeling guilty or eating in the dark, like at nighttime when you, if you catch your um, child or someone like eating at nighttime when no one can see and they like are the only ones that know, that's another thing because that goes along with that guilt of, eating and consuming calories and that's actually called the nighttime feeder isn't it yeah that's another one that can be really prevalent and and so now they're dieting another thing is like you really don't see them eating during the day but now all of a sudden at night they're eating but they're also eating junk food right and as much as possible uh you're worried about calories and all of a sudden there's this interest in the numbers on the back of anything that they're eating the macros and yeah like calorie that. counting is like another one I mean obviously that can be good to some degree but if you have someone that's very healthy and like skinny and looks great and then they're like oh well I'm down to this many calories a day or if they honestly if people are talking about food a lot that's another sign because you're, you become obsessive with it even if it's good things or bad things you become obsessed with food in general and your weight, how other people look. How long have you been, um, how long have you been free from or that you've stopped, that you've been? I mean, it's pretty ongoing. Like, sometimes I still will feel like that's the easiest way to do things or I get in a really bad place and that'll happen. But it's been about a year. This year has been really great for me. So you've not practiced anything you've not made yourself throw up and you've not starved yourself for a year correct mm -hmm. it's something though that you still battle with in your mind yeah I don't know if it'll ever fully go away I want to ask about this sense of control because mm -hmm. with bulimia and anorexia it is a power of it's a feeling of control right and I don't think a lot of people understand what that means. Everybody that's doing it understands. Right. But when you talk about it gives you a sense of control, what about that gives you a sense of control? Explain that. Yeah, during the time when it really first started, I things in my personal life with my family weren't going very well, and I was super upset about things. We had just had a big loss in our family, and I just felt, completely out of control honestly and then with so many things in dance and me going through puberty and getting like boobs and things like that I really just felt so out of control and then when I realized that I could change something pretty easily a quick fix to something I kind of became almost addicted to it because I was seeing changes and I was feeling great and then but I could control it and that was nice and that was a big change that was in my life at the time. Because it's also a secret, and so you can control the secret. Right. Is that a part of feeling like you have control over something in your life? Everything is going crazy around you, mm -hmm. but you have this secret, and nobody can take this from you, right. and this is what you have in your life. This is within your control, that you can stop whenever you want, but that you're choosing to do this. Yes, yeah, and that's another thing that I kind of would tell myself that, that oh, like, this is just a temporary thing or just until auditions are over, just until I get in to college or dance intensive. But then I keep doing it and I would keep making excuses to myself. So I honestly was lying more to myself than anything. 
there's a real struggle when somebody is doing this, the dialogue that's in the mind head. when mm-hmm. you sit there and you're eating something, you're already stressing because it's 20 minutes before yeah. dinner time and everybody's going to, you're already avoiding this. You're stressing about this. Mm-hmm. That happens and you go through and then you're eating. You're stressing about what you're putting in your mouth. And how I'm going to get to the bathroom, different things like that. What if I don't? Then what do I do? Like, I'm just going to have to go crazy exercise or something like that. Like, I would just have all these different things going on in my head, and it really just consumes you. That was another sign. Uh, quick trips to the gym to burn off meals Right, like is another I sign. I was dancing 25 hours a week, I, and I was 16 years old. You don't really need to do that. It's crazy. So when you're sitting here at the dinner table, it's really hard to even pay attention to conversations because you're you're so in your mind worrying about right. what you're eating and how fast and you can get because you know it's going to hit the stomach at, at you know you only have the time is the clock is ticking right and seeing if my mom's going to say anything and coming up with a different story this time or for me sometimes I would eat dinner just by myself and. How am I going to throw it out and so my mom doesn't see and things like that. And then if you're forced to hold it in, then there's this whole, you know, yeah. you hate yourself. You're right. Now there's the dialogue. No disappointed. Right. Yeah. Uh, what, what are the things that you're saying to yourself at this point? Yeah, you're honestly beyond stressed out. You're all your hard work like is gone you're you run to a scale mostly after and there's no way that it would change really and it might fluctuate point zero zero something but that's still such a loss to me and I would I would sit there and I would say okay what am I going to do tomorrow like it's going to be even less tomorrow like I'm not even going to drink water tomorrow or things like that and then like if it was too late I couldn't go to the gym I'd sometimes be like oh I'm just going to go out for a run or something like that, and I would go run around my neighborhood and different things like that. It's just like thinking of, like, what now? What could I possibly do to help this? And then you go through punishing yourself. Like you said, the next day, tomorrow, I'm not even going to let myself drink water. Yeah. So it makes it worse. And then you think, oh, well, I didn't drink water today, and then it was, I lost this much weight, so maybe I'm going to keep doing that next time. So it kind of makes it worse and worse. When you think those thoughts now, because we know that there's triggers. Yeah. Because now your mind, you, this is going to be a battle probably for the rest of your life. Yeah. What do you do now to combat a thought? Do you eat pizza? I mean, what? how do you feel when you eat pizza? I mean, it's still kind of scary, honestly. But I've always just, made sure that I have good like portion control with things because I mean I've gone to therapy and like my mom has helped so much and she's always said like everything's okay in small quantities and I have to tell myself that and I mean because it isn't good to eat a full pizza by yourself anyway but if you do that it's okay like it's not the end of the world and it's hard to realize that right I feel that way I honestly, it's taken me a few years that I've been able to, if I feel any kinds of bad emotions, I have to like call my mom right away and I talk to her about it or reschedule a appointment. I have to communicate it. And if I don't, I can go down a really bad path again. And that's when all the relapses happen is when you think, oh, I can do it myself. Like, no, you can't because you have a mental problem right now, you know? Right. It's, um, it's, it is absolutely a mental problem at that point because that's yeah. where it attacks mm-hmm. and that's where you can stop it. Right. What would so it's hard to do on your own. Right, because you're if if you are doing it all on your own, then you are your worst enemy. You're up against Truly. yourself. Right. And that's the hardest thing ever because you're lying to yourself, honestly, most of the time. What would you say to listeners now? This is not just, you know, for women. There are men out there who oh, do yeah. a lot of work in the competition industry, and there's a lot of men out there that 
you know, practice this yeah. in order to get their bodies down ready for, you know, the competition. The same day. kind of things, yeah. Uh, I mean, and you have to look a certain way, so sometimes they might manifest it in working out more, and, like, maybe if I'm skinnier, you can see my muscle definition better, but then for dance, sometimes it's hard because you are supposed to be lifting girls and different things, so you kind of have to have the endurance to do that, and sometimes you can tell that these boys are just, they don't have it because they're not nourishing their bodies in the correct way and eating the best diets and things like that. What is your life like today? What are you doing? Today I went to dance. For, I had dance in class from 9 till 3.30. And then I came home. And so I don't really have many breaks during that time. So I have to bring snacks, which also can be hard because you get so hungry and then you come home and then you're eating so much because you got hungry. So I've had to definitely help with making snacks before the night before, like I'll cut up an apple and bring peanut butter or something like that or a banana. And I have to have the night before or else I will like get an excuse in my head. Like, Oh, it's I'm too late to class. I can't, I don't have time to pack something. I'll usually have a snack during the day during that time. And then at around three 30, I come home and I might have another small snack. And then I wait, till dinner to eat a pretty full meal. So being prepared with meals is also a really big help in yeah. presenting and now trying to um, change avoid. things and avoid. Yeah. And that's true with anybody who is working on nutrition and, and meal prepping. That's why it's out there. Right. We, you know, somebody once said, I go through the fast food lines because it's, it's it takes too much time to, to cook and meal prep and but then it's like how long do you stand in line and wait for your food it takes you know when you collectively yeah. do this so being prepared and being successful um at nutrition now you're talking about peanut butter and apples like now you've got your fats you've got your carbs you've got your yeah. you know your um fruit and so now this is how you have to think you've got to get all your nutrition and yeah. your body's got to start working for you yeah, and stuff that will really hold you over throughout the day, like hard boiled eggs or just like little things like that. Uh, so you're still practicing, you're still dancing? Yes. And you're eating? Yep. And you're happy? Yes. <laughs> and there's three questions that we always end the interviews with, and I can't wait to hear your answers. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tell me where the love is in your story. Yeah, so I really think the love initiated in me getting help was my friend. My best friend really was looking out for me, and she did a really strong thing to talk to my mom about it, which could have been scary, and she could have been wrong, and she could have felt embarrassed or something like that, but she really thought that there was an issue, which there was, and I'll be forever thankful that she did that. And then. My mom helped me through it so much. She's always been super supportive and helped me in any way she can. She always wants me to have the best. So that was always good to have a really supporting mom. And then my therapist has always helped me through. And there's different resources that you can go to, like, on campus at different colleges and around in your high school or anything. So I didn't really utilize those as much, but I definitely could have, and I'm sure that would have been like a great outlet. And I really found a different love for myself. I think <laughs> that is, you know, I've had many interviews and I, I'm very impressed with a lot of people's response when it comes mm-hmm. to the love thing. And, and they, a lot of people say it goes right back to loving, figuring out loving themselves. Oh yeah. I think that's where it really all stems from. What, what are the lies in your stories? It definitely was just my thinking of how everything started, that if I did this, I would be a better dancer and a better person and people would like me more. And I did honestly get rewarded in some ways, but it obviously wasn't always the best ways. It wasn't the healthiest. And if honestly, the teachers or the people that were rewarding me maybe knew what was happening, it wouldn't be so positive, but I didn't make that correlation. And it honestly made me so much weaker when I was thinking it was making me so much stronger, but it 
was just doing the opposite. I just couldn't see it at the time. What is the truth in your story? I think that the truth is that I'm a better dancer and a person now. And it's not just about the dance. It's about yourself. And it's always going to be hard. It's never, it's not an easy thing. Sometimes it's hard to say, well, yeah, I did this and it's great now and I'm great. But it was such a long, hard fight and it still is probably always going to be. But it's worth it. And I've really never been happier. And I really did learn a lot about myself and about who's always going to be there for me. And it was just, if there's ever an issue, I just learned to reach out to people that are around me because they honestly probably care more than I think that they do. What would you say to somebody out there that's struggling? It's so hard, but you really do have to reach out to someone. And I know sometimes it's hard because you think no one's around. That's how I felt. I felt like no one cared. No one could help in any way. And there really are ways to get help. And it can be anyone, a teacher, a counselor, anything like that. It doesn't even have to be your immediate family or friends. And, or even like a phone call. I'm sure there are anonymous lines. Like it's just so helpful to talk to someone that's a third party even. And just like no bias, no nothing. They don't know anything. And it just helps a lot to get it off your chest. And you really do need the support because like we were talking about earlier, it's really a fight within yourself and it's really hard to stop lying to yourself and doing it all on your own. But there is always a light at the end of the tunnel. And it honestly, it's not the answer. It's, it's like an answer for a week or two, but it always ends up being way worse than the results that you're getting. And you can truly be a healthy person with eating and exercising and, I feel so much better and I look healthier, but I am still getting parts. I'm still getting roles and there's a good way to do it and there's a bad way to do it and you need to pick the best path for you. If somebody is practicing Selenium and anorexia, they're telling themselves, I'm not the, the other girls that do this. I'm not sick. There's some sickness there. I mean, and it's not a bad thing either because sometimes I would get so scared of that word and think, oh, I have a mental disorder to some degree. But that's not what it is. It's just a fight within yourself. Everyone does it every day. And there's so many people. There's so many more people. It's not just you. And, like, it's okay to not be okay sometimes. Absolutely. And to live in denial will take you further down this road where at Correct. some point you might have been able to stop this and never be affected by it by the rest of your life. Right. Yeah, it's hard because if you catch it early, it obviously it's going to be an easier journey, but if not, it's always going to be a fight. But honestly, everyone who dances or does anything or feels this way, they're probably pretty strong. And I think that anyone can get through it with the right tools. I'm just really pleased with getting getting to know you more through this and you being so honest of and course this is a lot of information it's incredible real life yeah story for you mm-hmm. living it every day uh thank you so much for you know sharing it with us and um we wish you the best and maybe we'll have a follow-up Thank you, of course. Yeah, (laughs) that would be amazing. Thank you again.